Welcome back to the Golf Smarter Podcast, Jim. Thank you, Fred. Great to be here again. It's great to see you. We're live on Blab right now with a uh, audience of one. Thank you, Paul. Uh, but but it doesn't matter because this is the podcast, and and in the podcast we'll have our conversation, and we let people eavesdrop on our conversation. But if they want in the future, if you're listening to this podcast, we do this live at blab.im where you can join in the conversation by typing in questions or even joining in on the video. Uh, and we've got some really exciting shows coming up in the next couple of weeks. Um, we're going to have Dr. Joseph Parent of Zen Golf is going to be returning to talk to us. Uh, and he'll do this live on Blab. He's got a new book coming out. And also, as we do every year at the beginning of the year, at the end of the year, it's going to be the Maddie B Awards for 2015. As Maddie Blake, uh, our our friend, the comedian, rips into the PGA Tour and tells us <laughs> what he thought of the tour and what happened during the year. And actually, that show will also be, and I'll give you more information later, but that's going to be our 10th anniversary show. Awesome. 10 years. And so um, I'm going to invite everybody, uh, every Golf Smarter listener to come on to Blab with us and tell us your Golf Smarter stories, things that you remember, things that I said that I shouldn't have, things that you took out to the golf course with you and, and improved your game, things that you've learned from Golf Smarter, whatever you want to say, but we're going to open this up so everybody can join us. That's what's happening in the future. But for right now, Jim Waldron, how are you? I'm great. Couldn't be better. How is your teaching year? Great. It was perfect. We had a good time and a lot of, a lot of new students. And uh, we had significantly, as you know, dry weather up here in the Pacific Northwest. And it looks like it's finally over. But yeah. yeah. It's good. But you were in Hawaii too. I mean, your schools, if I remember correctly, are Portland, Hawaii, and Palm Springs. Correct. Yeah. We don't do Palm Springs a lot, but usually one trip a year just for like a week. But, but I'm usually in Hawaii for about three to three and a half months in the winter. Mm -hmm. And then the summer, I, I stay in Portland. Okay. Okay. And it was a good year? Yeah, tell it was a good about, year. Tell me yeah. about some of your exciting students you're working with right now. You know, I had, I had a lot of interesting people this year. It's, we're, I'm getting a lot more younger people, probably because people our age are dying off, huh? The old, old golfers are dying <laughs> off. <laughs> Happy um, birthday, by the way, Jimmy. Oh, thanks. Yeah, well, uh, last Monday, December 7th is my birthday, 64. Right. A day um, to live. You're a Beatles year. Yes, my Beatles here. Exactly. <laughs> Your Beatles here. You're 64. Wow. Yeah, yeah. The big thing I've been doing in the past year and a half or so is uh, redoing our Great Shot, ball, Mastering the Craft of Ball Striking self-directed video instruction program, which we now have on our website as downloadable videos. Really? It's, the whole system is completely automated. It's pretty cool. I'm pretty proud of it. It took a lot. It took hundreds of hours of work. Yeah. to get these done and we've got all the taping done for the first seven of what will be eventually eight modules a module being kind of a a, a golf skill uh or, or a series of skills that have certain commonalities um we've got four done we'll have a total of 14 videos by the time we wow. we finish the project which won't be till about this time next year uh, but we finished all of module one, which is four videos. And they, they vary in length from about two to two and a half hours long. And A, B, and C have been up on our website for, for, for a while now. And D will be up, I think, on Monday or Tuesday of next week. And these are for sale? I have yeah, to assume. They're, they're for sale. Yeah, it's, it's, it's designed for, you know, years ago when I first got sort of notoriety in the golf instruction world, with these, uh, we were sort of the original total immersion boot camp, uh, long weekend, you know, all day Friday, Saturday, Sunday, uh, golf school on the planet at the time when we started in 95. And a lot of folks, especially with the rise of the internet, they just, you know, they, they, they saw an opportunity. They don't want to, a lot of people can't afford the time or the money to fly all the way to Portland or Hawaii for an in-person school. So I had all these requests by email or by phone. What about putting together some type of self-directed where the student is his own coach, but to make it as much like the actual great shot ball striking golf school experience as possible without actually having to be there. So it's sort of the, it's sort of the virtual version of our award-winning great shot golf school. Um, when the, when the project's completed, there'll be 14.
13 videos and the total viewing time will be almost exactly 24 hours which wow. is about what it takes to finish the, it's it's about a 22 and a half hour in person golf school wow that's yeah. a lot of video content it is it's a ton and so it's designed to be it can either be used as a step by step program for people who want to start from scratch whether they're already a mid to high handicap golfer or a beginner uh, or if you're an advanced golfer and you want to just go to the areas of your swing that you know are weak, you can just get the videos, video or videos for that one skill area. So, yeah, it's pretty much it's about 99 percent of what everything I know about the golf swing, <laughs> and including how to learn it. All right. Well, let's yeah. talk about the one percent here that you don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, so I'm curious, uh, you know, there's so many instructors now that are doing video lessons, uh, uh, virtual video lessons where you you shoot something on your phone, you send it to somebody, uh, to the teacher that you're working with, wherever they are in the world, they do their commentary on it and send you a link back and, and show you the commentary. Do you, have you uh, delved into yeah, that? I haven't, I haven't done those because I, I really don't like those. To me, I, I really feel that the essence of the whole teacher-student learning process is live interaction. Mm -hmm. So I, I do what I call remote lessons or what some people call online lessons, but it's not done as uh, something I send by email and then the person just looks at it. It's done like we're doing it right now on Skype webcam. It's live okay. interactive. Yeah, I want to I want to be able to talk to the person, mm -hmm. to the student. Um, you know, what actually happens is a pretty simple process. They, they shoot a bunch of video of their swing as per my instructions from various angles. Uh, and, and also close up on their grip. And then they send me that for me to review. And it, and it usually takes me about 30 minutes to review it if it's a new student. And then we set up a time to meet by Skype webcam and then go over the results. And that's and that usually takes anywhere from, if it's a new student, an hour to an hour and a half to go over. And that way they can see me demonstrate. Like if I recommend a drill, I can actually show them the drill in real time. I can watch them do it in real time, and I can say, "No, Bob, you, you got you got to move your foot over this way a little bit, or you got to get your shoulder to rotate this this much." So it's it's almost like having an in-person lesson. The only difference is I can't put my hands on the person, obviously. Right. But it's it's pretty close. And it's very effective. More and more these days, you can't put your hands on people anyway. I, <laughs> Things get true. weird. <laughs> Don't yeah. touch people. Don't touch people. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> I'm a hugger, right? I like uh -huh. to hug people. And I hadn't, my, my children had an intervention with me. Dad, you really didn't cut that out. You've yeah, gone past yeah. the age where it's not cute anymore. You yeah, I went through that stage of my two kids. Too. I know what you're talking about. So I was like, really? Gee, yeah. it was actually the day after my 60th birthday. They sat me down. It's like, all right, now that you're old. <laughs> They said, Dad, this has been bugging us. Let's yeah, see. Right, 60, right. Uh, yeah, yeah. Knock it off. 30, 30 years. <laughs> Knock it off. Yeah. That's funny. No, it's not. Uh, so, <laughs> so let's talk about um, how people can. Is there a way that people are going to be able to get access to see brief snippets of these videos? Are you going to mm -hmm. do the whole yeah. freemium thing where you give us two minutes of something? That's what we do here yeah. at the podcast. Yeah, yeah, this is, yeah, we have we have trailers. Uh, we don't have the trailer for Part D yet. That should be up in a week. But we have trailers for Part A. For the first three parts are Part A, B, and C. We have like you know two three minute trailers up uh, that are on our YouTube channel, uh, and I think there's links to them on our website as well. So you can you can kind of get a sense of what it is you're going to be purchasing. Um, um, but yeah, but that's that's a that's a great question, and you know I'm I'm pretty proud of the video stuff. I mean I, the video program that we shot. I, I think it's. Uh, just based on the feedback we're getting from students, it's uh, it's how can I put it? It's 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 original. It's not like anything else out there that I know of in, in golf instruction. And I think partially because just the, just the experience of doing this for 25 years uh, with with thousands of people, but also emphasizing that we're trying to form dominant habits. We're trying to you know get your subconscious mind to understand how to swing a golf club properly. And we're not we're not giving people stuff to think about using the traditional sort of approach where you, oh, what's my swing thought for today going to be? Right? It's not about yeah. that. It's about how do you actually yeah. train your body? It'd be like if I was teaching someone karate. I would teach. I would have the very similar approach that we're using in this video program. How do you train your body to form new movement patterns? Right? Yeah. yeah. So making a change uh, in your golf swing 
can be frustrating is is not even close to to what you know what comes to mind um it's so difficult because if you've been playing for a while and then you start working with a teacher and then they they you know they want to correct everything that you're doing so that you can you know get a draw on the ball make better contact not top the ball you have to make all these changes and you got your head spinning with all these things that you're trying to learn can help me figure out what is the best way to make a swing change um, and you know, the, stay on track. The, yeah, we've talked about this before. This is this is one of my favorite topics, and I literally could write a book about it because it's such a big deal. Jim, that's why I'm throwing the softballs here. What do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I have a book. I have an ebook that's that's actually the the Great Shot Golf School's training manual. It's 200 pages. It's the actual training manual, recently updated, and about. 25% of that manual is devoted to the sort of the psychology of how to learn effectively yeah. new golf skills, how to form new movement patterns and, and how, you know, how to practice effectively. But I think, you know, what it really comes down to is, is that in our culture, there's a, there's sort of a mass delusion that we all suffer from to varying degrees. And one of my favorite books on the subject is, is actually called the user illusion, uh, which is spent about, I think it came out about 15 years ago, but it's sort of a primer on, um, on neuroscience and uh, the limits of the conscious mind. But I think once you really understand how little conscious control your your willpower, your the part of your mind we call the conscious mind, the part that can think, actually has over your body motion when moving at normal golf swing speeds. Really? It's close to 0% precision control. So... Uh, it's, you know, because the swings, the swing is the duration of the swing is about one and a half seconds from start to finish. It's about one second from the moment of takeaway back to impact, and all your muscles except for one, if you if you're doing it right, of the 70 major muscle groups, you're only not using one, which is your biceps. So you got 69 of the 70 major muscle groups that are activated. You've got all the bones in motion. So it's a biomechanically complex motion by its very nature that takes place in a tiny unit of time, or roughly a second, if you count from the moment of takeaway to impact. Uh, so it fits the literal definition of what's called in, in neuroscience or neurophysiology involuntary motor, uh, involuntary motion, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so what that means is, is that from a training standpoint, from a learning uh, and coaching standpoint, what I have to ask myself is how can I get somebody's subconscious mind, the deeper part of their brain, to understand the information I'm, I'm giving the person at such a deep level of their mind that they begin to make new movement patterns fairly quickly and fairly easily. And that process is interesting kind of in and of itself, but and there's several parts to that, but one of the really big parts I call deep insight. And in the, the term that's often used sort of commonly in golf is a light bulb moment. When you have a light bulb moment, it's not just your intellectual conscious mind that understands something new about the golf swing, new and, act and also true, or at least effective in terms of helping you improve your ball flight. Uh, it's, it's a deeper layer of your mind that, that, that has the light go off as well. So it's almost kind of like you're, you've got these two minds here, you know, conscious and subconscious, and, and they both kind of merge in a light bulb moment, there's an enlightening moment when new understanding happens. Mm -hmm. And when that occurs for people who have uh, above average athletic ability, they're able to make the new movement pattern in the very next golf swing. It's not permanent yet. It takes more repetitions right. to make it a yeah, habit. But it's I, the next golf swing, and especially if you're there. But the key yes. is how do you get that to work when you're not there? Yeah, well, that, that, so that, that's a good point. So once you have the initial deep insight experience, then it's a question of doing a drill or an exercise or uh, even just a golf swing. So some of these things you can do hitting balls if they're, if they're by their very nature, they're, they're very simple. They're more, you know, they don't take a lot of uh, 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 mechanical uh, complexity. Like, like, like I'll give you an example, like grip pressure. There's nothing complicated about grip pressure because – the basic rule there is if, if, if you're starting with something static at like, like, like you would at setup when your body's basically not moving and that aspect of your body doesn't change or at least should not change, 
then you do have the ability to maintain that. So for example, you can learn very quickly how to maintain proper grip pressure because you're not actually training a new movement pattern. You're simply starting out with something statically. You're holding the club with a certain amount of pressure at the beginning, it's set up, and, you're not, and then hopefully you're not changing it throughout the swing, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that takes just a little bit of practice, a little bit of repetition, maybe, you know, maybe even just a, an hour or two at the range to kind of get a hold of that new skill to where you can kind of reproduce it without, you know, any, any problem, any, any, any thought really. Because it's a feel-based thing. You're just, you're just feeling how much pressure you're applying to your fingers onto the golf club, right? But if you're trying to change how your wrists release, the wrist cock angle, how that releases, and it releases in a tiny fraction of a second at a high rate of speed, that takes, once you have the initial insight, that takes a lot of repetitions to start to break through to get to what I call the 51% level. That's the tipping point. When you're, when you're able to, at the 51% level, you've done enough repetitions to where you kind of, you kind of tipped over to where it gets a little easier. So until that 51% level is reached, it's sort of like you're still climbing up the mountain and, it's, and it takes effort and willpower and, and, you know, some form of thought. Um, when I say thinking, I don't mean literal, but I mean, it takes some form of intention, right? Mm -hmm. um, and after after you reach 51%, it takes more and, more and more, you know, less and less intention as you keep on training. But it's at some point you realize, oh, I, I can do it now without thought. I don't take, it doesn't take any intention. I don't have to intend to do it. I can feel myself do it. And even when I'm trying not to do it, I, if I put my mind there, I happen to feel myself in this case, maintain the proper grip pressure, right? So it's just people have to be willing, golfers have to be willing to put that that actual repetition training time in to get to where they want to get to in golf, right? Yeah. You know, that that epiphany, that light bulb that you talked about, I found that it it's almost like that 10,000 hours conversation that you really, to get to those subtle moments, um, you really have to go through a lot before you can narrow it down and have something that kind of just, you know, enlightens at that very moment. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I found that there's things, you know, and I've been playing golf now for, again, I started, I started my forties, so I've not been playing that long, but I'm finding things that are going on now that I've heard people talk about. And I mean, this is what I do. I talk about golf with sure. people every week. Yeah. I have heard a mention, I've heard a time, but it took so long for some of those to just all of a sudden, Oh, that's what they're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that would apply to anything you were learning. You could be taking violin or piano lessons or yeah, stand up uh, comedy lessons from your friend or, you know, um, I'm uh, actually teaching myself how to play the ukulele. So I totally, yeah, well, you know, what I'm talking about. Yeah, it's, a, it's the same thing. I mean, they're, they're, you know, so a lot of learning is what they call in the Zen tradition, preparing the ground of the mind. So it takes a certain amount of study. Uh, if you're going to follow the Buddhist path, meditation practice, so it takes a certain amount of study, sort of basic Buddhist psych psychology principles and a little bit about some of the philosophical concepts. And you really haven't seen any big ch sudden change in your understanding of how your mind works or how the world works. And then one day all of a sudden, wham, the, you know, the lightning bolt strikes. So mm -hmm. that preparing the ground is, it applies to golf too. It's a, it's a really important thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's talk about the the arm swing illusion, which uh, is what we promoted for this uh, mm -hmm. this episode of the podcast. What does that mean? Wow, that's a great question. Uh, <laughs> in, in, in its simplest form, I'll, I'll answer as simple as I can. In its simplest form, it means that the way most golfers, and I by most I mean well over ninety nine point nine percent, view the golf swing to some degree, not, some, some do it a lot, some do it a little bit. But when they watch, especially if they watch uh, tour pros on television, it, the sort of the default premise that is so obviously true to the person watching, even though in reality it's, it's not true, it looks like what the arms do is independently make a across the chest and around the body motion. Um, I'm going to lower this a little bit. Maybe you can see a little bit better if I move back a little bit. Sure. Sort of like that. Now, it's not that the arms don't go a little bit that way. They do actually, in a proper takeaway, the arms make a slight motion this way. But I'm talking this much. It's a small amount. If you, you can actually measure it. And we, we teach 45. We want to have our left arm 
45 degrees like mine is right now to my shoulder girdle. Here's my shoulder girdle here, right? So there's a, if you looked at a camera overhead looking down, you'd see a 45 degree angle, okay. right? And then we want, after we attain that 45 degree angle on, on the takeaway, we want to let our right elbow fold. And when the right elbow folds, both arms go up toward the sky a little bit like this. But if I turn this way, maybe, hopefully this will show up on the webcam. You well, can probably yeah, and see. This, isn't, this is a podcast, so for the audio listeners, sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but for those for those who who, are, who see the video part, there there it is. You see, my my arm is still in front of my chest. So as opposed to looking like this, where it's behind, you know, you get stuck behind you. So the idea mm -hmm. is, in order to have a good golf swing, you have to synchronize some form of arm motion often called the arm swing, which I think is a bad choice of words. I would never want to call it an arm swing, but there's an independent arm motion in the backswing, which is on that 45 degree angle and away from your body, about six to eight inches for most people, and then up, right? And then of course it reverses as your right arm starts to, starts to straighten on the downswing, then it kind of reverses. But the point is we don't want to have a arm dominant swing where there's hardly any engagement of the pivot, which would be this, right? Engaging the pivot. And which is how most, you look, you look at a typical mid to high handicap, someone who's in you know, around 15 handicap or higher. Very few of those guys or gals have enough pivot. They don't rotate enough. They don't turn their core. They don't turn their, their upper torso or shoulder girdle, especially some underturn their hips and some will overturn their hips. But what I'm talking about is more the core and the, and the upper chest and shoulder girdle. They don't turn it enough. And that's your main source of power in the golf swing. And it also has a huge influence on how the club moves through space, hopefully on plane, right? So um, that's that's sort of a, a, a short synopsis of what the arm swing illusion is. So when, when people watch a good player, they're seeing, they're seeing that side to side motion independently and what of course what's really happening with the illusion is the arms are moving side to side but but 90 percent of that side to side arm motion is not independent arm motion meaning arm muscles moving the arms it's the pivot moving the arms since your arms are connected to your shoulder girdle when you pivot properly that pivot motion both in the back swing and the forward swing creates arm motion in the horizontal dimension which is the you know the sort of away from the target and then the toward the target dimension, right, on, on the forward swing. Um, but there's you got to distinguish between independent arm motion, which is arm muscles moving the arms independently of your pivot, versus dependent arm motion, which is the pivot motion moving the arms, right? Right. And that that's what that uh, well, well, module two of the Great Shot series of, of instructional videos is devoted entirely to the arm swing illusion concepts. Two and a half hours. There's a lot a lot of information, a lot of drills. And that is all at uh, balancepointgolfschool.com. Uh, Golf balancepointgolf.com. Balancepointgolf.com. No, yeah. yeah, no school. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so what happens now? The, so many amateur golfers, and that's really who I want to talk about. I want to talk about the t PGA Tour pros because sure. that's what they do all day. I mean, we, sure. we can't play that game. I don't want to play that game. But um, weird, weird how bad is the baseball swing and how much does it come into mind for most golfers? And I'm, I'm talking about men, but you know, women too, growing up, they play a more little league than we do. And you know, that's our orientation is, yeah, is baseball. Yeah. How bad is that for the golf swing based on the fact that there's not a lot of arm movement, what you're saying? Um, you know, it's funny because on the WRX forum right now, there's, there's been up for a few days. There's a thread with that very question. How similar is the base of a good baseball swing to a good golf swing? You know, Ted Williams wrote a great book. I think it's called The Art and Science of Hitting a Baseball. He also was a fanatical golfer, and there's a lot of references to similarities between a good baseball swing and a good golf swing in that book. And Ben Hogan believed that there were a lot of similarities. He, he, he said that a, a good golf swing is like – is exactly like I think he was exaggerating for for to make a point, but he said it's exactly like a, a baseball swing except you're bent over at the hips. So there are definitely some similarities. Um, the, yeah, the, there's the definitely big, similarities. The but, biggest difference is the arm the arm motion in a baseball swing. Uh, very quickly, if you if you do it right, 
and I was a pretty good hitter when I, I played a lot of baseball growing up in Chicago back in the 60s, 50s and 60s. If you do it right, you, you flatten the plane of your arms and the plane of the bat to be in the same plane as your, as your chest. So when you baseball, so you see these guys that are holding like this with that flying right elbow, and then they step into the pitch, and they kind of go like that, right, and they flatten it. Um, and then the wrist release, which there's also wrist release in baseball, yeah. is also in the same plane. But in golf, for all kinds of reasons, mainly that the ball's on the ground, we have to have an arm motion and a club shaft motion that does not move in the same plane that our chest is moving. So we're basically, we're making like a wood chopping motion. Imagine chopping wood with an ax, a downward, mostly downward motion with our right arm, the angle in our right arm straightening, the two wrist cock angles straightening, and the two upper arms going from their top of backswing back down to the chest. That's mainly a downward motion, right? Whereas mm -hmm. in baseball, it's this is why baseball is actually easier than the golf swing. You're making the arms the, and the wrist action and the chest action in more or less the same plane. So that oh, I, we actually have a drill for this in that arm swing illusion video where I, I do a drill where I have people take their hand, go like this with their wrist cocked, and if they put their other hand up here in their chest, and they're gonna they're gonna keep their head still, and they're gonna rotate their body like they would on the forward swing. But while they do that. They're going to let that little bend in the right arm and the and the big bend in the wrist go down like they're hammering a nail or chopping wood. So they're going to go like mm. this. At the same moment in time, they go like this. And a lot of people literally can't do it at first, which looks like that, right? Yeah, I mean, it seems awfully complex. It's it's not complicated. It's actually it's you know what rubbing your tummy and patting your head is, right? It's yeah, not complicated. It's easy to understand. You have to make a downward motion with your wrists while you make a horizontal or circular motion with your chest, which are literally in opposite directions. Your wrists are going down toward the ground, and your chest is going in a circular motion toward your right-handed golfer, toward your left, toward the target. So you're coordinating the two things at the same moment in time. And that's, I think, one of the really big reasons why so many golfers struggle with mastering a proper golf swing because they don't a, they don't realize they've got to make different dimensional mo motions with different body parts moving in different dimensions at the same moment in time and even after they do have the light bulb moment which they have from coming to see me everybody gets it conceptually when they come to school it's just like rubbing your tummy and patting your head it takes coordination right it takes brain power but the on the golf swing they don't get a backswing. And, you know, you say it's, it's... You mean the baseball swing? Yeah, the baseball swing. You're saying it's easier to hit a baseball. I mean, it's like there's a ball coming at yeah, you. They're, a golf they're ball already flying the there. The, there are, they are, they yeah. take a backswing, but they're, they're static at the position while they're waiting for the pitch. Yeah. Right. Why don't we do that with golf? Why is, don't we start... You, there Why is, don't we start back there? There is a method. You should get this. I don't think this guy's still around, but uh, there was a guy back in the 70s, I think 1977... They did, a, I believe my memory serves, they did a cover story on this with Golf Magazine where you started at the top. And uh, Johnny Miller commented, has commented about that, saying that, that was going to be the golf swing of the future. It did turn out to be that way for all kinds of reasons. The problem is it lacks rhythm, it lacks tempo, it's, it lacks mm -hmm. sort of natural naturalism or natu natural athleticism to start sure. from that top position. Um, I think that's the main drawback. But uh, I, well, I did see... Um, a few years ago, I go to the Hawaiian Open every year. This, now it's called the Sony Open in, in Honolulu. Right. And uh, Sandy Lyle, the former uh, British mm -hmm. Open champion from Scotland, he was in a bad slump for about, I think at that point, about two years. And he was doing a drill on the range there at Wildlife Country Club where he was presetting his top of backswing position, stopping, pausing for maybe, I don't know, some, two or three seconds, and then starting his downswing mm -hmm. from a complete dead stop at the top. And he was hitting it really good. And my buddy and I went out the, later that day, and we happened to see him on the golf course. And at least in that round, that's how he had all his long game shots. He was pre, he was doing the drill in a PGA tournament event. Wow. Yeah, it's pretty strange. He hit it really good. So it, it is possible to do it that way. Well, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with a uh, teacher named Jim Venetis, mm -hmm. who's uh, based in Southern yeah. California. And um, great guy. He's been on the show a bunch in the last couple months uh, because I got I'm totally enamored with his swing. But he has – your arms aren't there, but your body is. Your body is set up mm -hmm. so that you're at the top of your swing. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. and you just stay there. You don't move. He talks about stillness, but you're almost starting with your back to the target and 70% of your weight on your front foot. Mm -hmm. And what he's saying is you're going to make better contact. You're going to hit a draw, mm -hmm. but the, it's incredibly awkward to learn. I'm finding to learn that position but the times that I'm, I'm, when it works, it works incredibly well. I'm having greater distance. I'm hitting a draw for the first time. Um, and, um, you know, it, it's, it's fascinating. Um, so in all this conversation about the arm movement, the arm illusion, the uh, arm swing illusion, what about the lower body? Because when I, watch, when I watch amateur golfers, when I'm out on the golf course, I see a lot of people who are moving a lot of their lower body and are wondering why they keep topping the ball and wondering why they're missing the ball. And it seems like there's a lot of shift going on that you want to try to help them to quiet that down. Yeah. yeah that's a, that's one reason I call my company balance point. Cause my opinion is that, that of all the many fundamentals, there's lots of fundamentals I believe in the golf swing or lots of influences. You can put it that way. The most important is balance for lots of legitimate reasons. But uh, that's the very, when I work with a new student, if they want to work on their golf swing, on their ball striking, that's the very first thing I look at is, is their, how their feet connect to the ground. Mm -hmm. whether, there's, whether they have a stable lower body or whether they have an unstable lower body. And again, if you're in, in that mid to high handicap range, there's a pretty good chance you have an unstable lower body. Mm -hmm. um, and basically that just basically means too, you know, too much leg, knee, foot, foot and ankle motion. And it could mean too much weight shift either direction, too much lateral weight shift. You don't really need any lateral weight shift on the backswing if you're reasonably flexible. Uh, if, you're, if you're somewhat inflexible, maybe a tiny little weight shift laterally in the backswing just to help you turn more. But you definitely need a, a moderate amount of weight of lateral weight shift on the forward swing. You got to get some, some, some weight shifted into that left leg. Basically, you want to get your your left hip, your left knee, and your in the in the center of your left ankle, more or less in a, in a straight line perpendicular to the ground, by the end of transition into the forward swing, and then you rotate. You're basically rotating your left hip over your top of your left thigh bone, and everything above your left hip. So your whole torso, your hip, your torso, everything, is rotating over your left leg, and that's one reason why you have to have a lateral weight shift. Um, and you can do that too much. It's, pre it's a pretty common flaw for guys and gals who are between about five and 12 handicaps to have too big a, a, what we call a lateral sway on the mm. forward swing. Really? Single-digit handicap players oh, have yeah. issues, body oh, yeah. issues like that? Yeah, yeah. And high mm. handicaps tend to have the opposite. They tend to have a lateral sway in the backswing and, and, and no lateral, or very, very little lateral shift to the front leg on the forward swing. That tends oh. to be the case, yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Hey, uh, uh, speaking to the people who are listening right now live on Blab, if you have a question for Jim, uh, there's a couple of ways that you can participate. You can go ahead and just type and you see there's a little animation there. If you type, um, what is it? Uh, yeah. Ha uh, slash Q and then type your question. I could submit that and Jim will be able to see it as well. Um, but you're also there. I know that uh, you got some fans of yours here, Jim. You, if you want to go ahead and um, join us in the conversation, if you want to be on video and you want to talk to Jim, you're more than welcome to join us. So just click on the call in circle there and we'll bring you in and, and you can ask a question. So, but now I want to get back to that wage shift. And mm -hmm. I know that you, you, talk about that balance thing one of the things that jim venatis who i was just talking about is instead of rotating around the spine with your weight shift forward on your front foot you're rotating around and you're not even really rotating because you're you're, you're staying in one position but all everything is rotating on above on your left leg and staying on your left side yeah, I don't. I don't believe in that. That. that was the original version of stack and tilt, and and, and they kind of original founders have kind of moved away from that. I mean, uh, I guarantee there's never been a great player in, on, in the history of tournament golf who had majority of the weight. I'm talking a lot, a lot more weight on their left leg than their right leg. Yeah. And there's some new technology that that measures that measures what's called ground reaction forces and you know pressure pressure plates. 
Uh, now, weight weight shifts in in the swing that I teach, which is the swing you see on on the majority of the of the LPGA and, and PGA tour tour pros. There is a shift, but it's a rotate. We call it a rotational shift. So when you set up properly to start with, and then you rotate your core, your chest, and your hips, in the case of a right-handed golfer, to your right, there is a weight transfer, but it's rotational primarily, right, or even entirely. Uh, mm -hmm. And so weight weight or pressure is probably a better term. Shifts into your right foot, basically into your right heel, and then a little bit of weight shifts into the the ball, inside ball of your left foot. And those, so it kind of goes, your feet are like this at the start and then the weight kind of goes like this. Because that, mm. when, you're, when you're rotating your hips, your core and your, your whole torso, even your head rotates a little bit, that puts force more down here into your right heel and, 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 it, and it moves a little bit into your inside ball of your left. Then there's a lateral shift to the left leg and then it reverses and through impact as the hips, the core and the chest rotate. That's when you get more weight in the front foot. So it sounds like Venetus is teaching a, a very unorthodox swing style. That's not. Oh, it's, yeah, it's, it's incredibly something different. unorthodox. It's yeah. really unorthodox. Yeah. Um, but he's he's having a tremendous amount of sex uh, success with his students. And maybe he's having a tremendous. He never could be the sex, too. Who knows? I, awesome. I, I'm not right. going there. I'm not going there. I'm not going there. <laughs> so <laughs> am I uh, turning? Am I really turning red right now? No, um, so. Um, can you define stack and tilt? And are the, is there teachers using that now? I've heard you know, it's terrible for your back. Uh, yeah, it's. I, I to be totally honest, I have read the book and I've read a fair amount of online posts about it, but I've never talked yeah. to the two the two guys who you know, uh, Mike Ben and Andy Plummer, who invented it. Although I did take, and I'm pretty sure they were in the same one I was in in 1994. I did a I did a three day. Some, Mac O'Grady called a symposium. I'm pretty sure they were then fellow attendees. Um, and I know it's changed a lot. So anything I say about the old version would sort of be, what's the point? Because they've, they've actually, I think, made it better in the last few years. But it did, the original stack and tilt was, I think, sort of made primarily or marketed toward very high handicaps who have trouble getting their mm -hmm. weight forward. So rather than start mm -hmm. normal, shift back, and then shift forward, they had people start with it already on the front leg with the idea that it would simplify the swing and make contact better. But it also creates a number of other issues, which it tends to affect the club shaft. It can, it can make the, the plane of the club shaft too steep coming in the downswing, which is why it tended to work reasonably well starting it from about a seven iron through a lob wedge. But when you got to six iron through driver, especially driver ball on the tee, people typically quite often, a lot of people who tried it had trouble hitting the driver because it created too steep an angle of attack coming into the ball. Lots some other issues, but um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not up on what their, a lot of what their current stuff is, but they, and they you're not a big success. fan of it. I'm not a big but fan of it, but I don't, I don't yeah. really like to go. I, I have a sort of a, a strong professional ethos to not in public, at least not in a, in an intense way, criticize other teachers. I think it's sort of unprofessional to do that. So Agreed. I mean, obviously they've had. I'm not. Success. I'm not asking you to do that. Yeah. I would never ask you to. Do yeah, that. yeah, but they clearly they've had success. A lot of people swear by it, even even the original yeah. version. So, you know, the yeah. thing about golf is you got to find. That it's not like there's like one perfect way. I mean, I actually believe my model is the perfect way. But I mean, but there's plenty <laughs> of people who don't use it who are on the PJ Tour, like a Bubba Watson, who is a throwback style to the Jack Nicklaus swing from the swing I grew up with in the '60s and '70s that John R. Miller used. Uh, Tony Lima used people like that, you know, um, and played, you know, one majors with it. So, right. Course, but you, it's, got it's so hard now. to, it's so hard to bring Bubba into any conversation about this because he, he, right. He never had lessons. He just started yes. hitting the yeah. ball forever. Right. Yeah. He's a sure um, talent. Yeah. Fun to watch. It's though. just, sure talent. it's fun to watch, but yeah. it's a terrible conversation. He's a terrible conversation piece <laughs> as far as when you're working on, you know, on your swing. Um, well, here, here, here's what my take on it. Here's, what, there, there, here's one thing I know for sure that's not an opinion. This is absolutely fact. Okay. And I think anybody who has a modicum of critical intelligence would agree with it. If you were going to design a robot to swing a golf club. Iron Byron. Exactly. But I'll go even further. If you were going to design a new robot, even, forget Iron Byron. What would, mm -hmm. the, what would an engineer, someone who was a smart engineer, would, wouldn't the operating principle to design it with a – as much simplicity 
that's possible to the mechanics. In other words, you wouldn't deliberately design a golf swing, a golf ball hitting robot with lots of inherent built-in design characteristics of fragile parts or parts that would uh, tend to break or parts that would tend to not synchronize with adjacent parts, right? In other words, the operating principle would be simplicity. And that is the operating principle in sports biomechanics. The idea there is you want to you want to have a motion, whether it's a roundhouse kick in karate, which I spent years teaching, you probably know former martial arts instructor, or a baseball swing or a slap shot motion in hockey or a golf swing. You want to reduce the complexity that's somewhat inevitable to the to the bare minimum number of moving body parts, because if you get it to that level of simplicity, you'll have less balance issues, you'll have less timing issues, less tempo and rhythm and timing issues. You'll be able to repeat the motion much more easily. Whereas if you have a highly complex motion with lots of moving body parts, it's gonna take more time to master that motion. It's yeah. gonna be less reliable, especially under stress, which all golfers to some degree, even just guys playing on a, on a, you know, a Saturday NASA type of, uh, with your buddies, that type of an event, there's pressure. I mean, we, we put pressure on ourselves. So if Absolutely. we know that stress can cause mechanical breakdown, what I call flinching. Uh, so you, so you, from a purely mechanical standpoint, you want to have a swing that has ideally the fewest moving parts. Now the model swing that I teach, I believe fits that criteria. And uh, I can give you some examples. So Justin Rose is an example of someone who has a very simple golf swing. Uh, yeah. Billy Horshaw, I like his action. Uh, Roy McIlroy. Uh, a lot of the golfers on the LPGA Tour from South Korea, partly because they a lot of them came out of the same government-sponsored training program, they have very simple swings. Um, Suzanne Pedersen from Norway has a real simple swing. Uh, hmm. Bill Haas, um, Jason Day. There's so some, Ernie Els always had like the just the smoothest, most gentle swing. Is that also an example of that, or is? Yeah, I mean, Els. Yeah, I think Els was in the in the ballpark. Certainly, he's he's got a little bit of some of the older uh, swing from the 1960s, 70s, a little bit in his swing. But uh, the basic idea, what I the style I call the, my personal term for it is leverage spin. Leverage means maximum use of your levers within reason, meaning on, which to me Bubba would be a case of being beyond reason because he's moving his arms too much, but moderate amount of independent arm motion, full wrist cock range of motion. So you want a grip and that allows maximum wrist cock range of motion, which is what I call the power grip. And you want to make sure you cock your wrists all the way on the backswing so you can get that leverage, that potential source of club head speed uh, to utilize on the forward swing. Uh, a fairly centered pivot, uh, meaning not little or no lateral weight shift on the backswing for balance. A moderate lateral weight shift, not a big, on the forward swing, again, for balance, and a club shaft that tracks more or less on the same plane angle relative to the ground throughout the swing that it started on at address. So if you're not making major shifts to the shaft plane angle, like Bubba is, which is one reason why he's like the opposite of the model I teach, it by definition, it looks prettier, it looks more machine-like, it looks more efficient because it is, right? There's fewer mm -hmm. things going on, right? Yeah. Interesting. Hey, John submitted a question that uh, he he has for you. Okay. Uh, I can see you reading it. it says, uh, Jim, I'm having trouble getting into the get set position, fighting the hitting impulse. Yeah, that's a great Does that one. Make sense? Wow. Yeah. Yeah. The um, get set position John, is. Thanks so much for, for submitting your question. Yeah, thank, Stephen, thank hey, you, John. Um, you can join us. The get set position is commonly, it's because at Balance Point Golf Schools, we have this really cool drill I came up with 25 years ago called Get Ready, Get Set, Go. Like a, like, like a timing drill. But the get okay. set position is the, is when your hands are about hip height on the right side of your body if you're a right-handed golfer. So basically halfway between top of backswing and impact is the get set position or the end of what's mm -hmm. called the transition, right? And what, what he's referring to there is it's, it's a, there's a very strong impulse to take the muscles in your wrists the muscle, well, basically your right tricep, the muscles in your wrist, the muscles that surround your upper arm joint where they connect to your shoulder girdle and use those muscles directly as power sources to speed up the club head. And the, the commonly used term in golf instruction is early release. So if you take the muscles, if you take the right tricep, and especially if you have only average tempo, which most people do, if you actively fire that tricep too quickly, too much, 
especially if you have average tempo. That's a form of early release. If you take the wrist cock muscles and throw the wrist cock angle away, that's even more common. That's a form of early release. If you take the muscles around your upper left arm and pull your arm down and across your chest, that's the arm version of the hit impulse. Same with the upper right arm. So that's what he's referring to. So, you know, the, the ultimate answer, we have drills for this, which is hard to show on a podcast. But the basic idea is, well, I'll, I'll give you two. One is it's the main answer to that dilemma that he's dealing with is something that I use. Almost, it's almost gotten to be among my assistants a joke and some of my regular students because I say it all day long. I've even said it in some of the golf forums I participated. I call it the A word awareness. Oh. If, if you want, if this, the starting point for making any improvement, not just this particular flaw he's referring to, but, but including that flaw, you have to be aware, objectively aware using what I call feel channel or kinesthetic awareness for what your body and club are actually doing. Right. And, and that you can, you can know it after the fact by videotaping yourself and looking at it, but that doesn't really help very much. All it does is go, Oh yeah, I, got, I see a video of myself and I'm throwing my wrist cock angle away way too early. How do I stop doing it? I'm trying to stop. I'll, I get people all the time. They spend four or five hours at the range trying not to do that with no improvement. Like you mentioned earlier, sure. it's not a matter of willpower, right? <laughs> if, if, if golf improvement was a matter of willpower, we'd all be, you know, zero handicaps within three or four months exactly. of the game. Right. So no, you have to be aware of what the body's doing. Um, it's the same thing. If I was, uh, if, if I was your psychotherapist, you can't even say, Oh, I got this drinking problem. How am I going to stop drinking? I can't stop. I've tried on my own. Right. And so what's, what, what is the psychotherapeutic, intervention all about it's not that different from making swing changes when you're dealing with flaws like this right so i tell people try to do it on purpose and be aware of the muscles that are causing the flaw try to throw it away on purpose right mm -hmm. and all of a sudden people go holy crap i'm really really throwing it away i knew i was throwing away intellectually before but now i can feel the muscles activate that are causing the flaw as soon as that level of insights achieved Usually, for most of my students, the flaw is massively reduced in intensity or even completely eliminated hmm. by simply being aware of what the flaw is, how the, how the muscles are doing the wrong thing. That alone can stop the flaw from happening, which is, I know it sounds paradoxical, but it's true. And the other yeah, answer I mean, that for John is, is you're not going to be able to throw your wrist cock angle away without first tightening your finger pressure. I know that for absolute fact from teaching this for 25 years and I consider myself an expert on the hit impulse. I do part of part of a whole one day school on the mental side is devoted to the hit impulse. And I've never seen a student who maintains the proper grip pressure, throw the wrist cock angle away from the top too early. Never. So it always starts as first you squeeze, then you throw. If you don't squeeze, you're not going to throw it away. That's how it works. Fascinating. Yeah. That's interesting. You talk about awareness of Fred Shoemaker of extraordinary sure. golf. Yeah. Right, he, he's all over the awareness part. Yeah. Great coach. Great I consider coach. myself an awareness coach, but I use the vehicle of golf as the means whereby. Well, it's so important. But it again, the golf swing, as you talked about earlier, the golf swing is so fast. It's hard to be aware of what you're doing when you have an when you have an intention in your mind to then try to break down and, and pay attention to the nuances of yeah. every part of your And that's something I wanted to mention. I wanted to bring up from your earlier question about making swing changes back to that lack of precision, voluntary control. Now where you do have precision, voluntary control over high speed moving body parts, right? Which you don't have at full speed, normal one and a half second speeds is when you're swinging in slow motion. And this is the Asian martial arts sort of key to learning very rapid, high speed, precision body motion, like rapid kitch, kicks, blocks, and punches. I, I started at age, at age 11 with a, one of the best martial arts teachers in the world and growing up in Chicago. And you know, in, in the early months of training, we did no full speed motion whatsoever. No blocks, no kicks, no punch. Everything was done in super slow-mo in front of a mirror. And I adopted that 25 years ago to teaching golfers. So. If they follow my advice, they do all the moving bot, the high speed moving body part training in super slow motion first. And once they once they have some degree of proper form, it's super slow. Super slow mo is 60 seconds from start to finish of the swing. Then they graduate. Yeah, Lynn Marriott to, calls that. I'm, yeah. I'm sorry. Lynn Marriott calls that the uh, Tai Chi swing. Correct. And then slow motion is 30 seconds from start to finish. And then we have half speed 
We even have three quarter speed, quarter speed. But the idea is you, you only graduate to a speed where you actually do have control over your proper form. If you're losing control over how the club's moving through space, and you're moving, which will be because some, some one or more body parts are not doing their thing properly. And you just happen to know that your, let's say your shoulder girdle's not moving properly. You're, you're doing it your old way that you do at full speed. Then you have to do it more slowly in front of the mirror. And you don't graduate until you have the, the ability to do it with perfect form at that, whatever speed you're doing it at. Right. That's, that's really important. Awesome. Hey man, it's great to talk to you. Yeah, uh, well, likewise. Thank Let's you. See. Look at that. It's already an hour into this thing. I think this is our um, ninth our ninth time together, something like that. Is it really? I think well, so. Well, and nothing will ever rival doing the show at a Thai restaurant in Portland together. That was fun. Um, that was a lot of That was episode 400. And now we're at, we're at exceeded 500. So it's been a while yeah, since Yeah, that was like my together. dinner with Andre, except it was my dinner with yeah. Jim or my dinner with Fred. <laughs> Fred, yeah. Yeah. My golf dinner. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, that was a lot of fun, and and here we are with all the recording equipment on the table, and the the server was like, "What are you?" I got to make another point because I'm afraid I'm going to lose this. I lost track there. So back to that point I'm about sorry, making the changes. Not. You know, it, it when you because you mentioned about how do you how do you you, you, you I think you used the ter term your thinking your thinking mind is trying to make your body do something. See, the beauty of this approach is sort of mind body connection approaches. You don't do that. You don't. You're not trying to make a change. And how you're now, there are a few exceptions, but they're only for advanced players. People are all five handicaps or better. But in general, if you're a six handicap or higher, you're not going to try to change how your body moves because you can't. You can't do it successfully through thought. In fact, if you try to make a change using thought or effort or willpower, you'll tend to create a flinch, which is a mild form of a yip, and you'll actually hit the ball worse. Now, occasionally you can flinch and still, and still somehow through sheer pure randomness, get back to impact in a better position with your club face and hit a good mm -hmm. shot. But that's like, that's like having three lemons come up in the slot machines in Vegas. That's luck, right? It's not skill. So <laughs> yeah. uh, I think no, knowing the limitations of the, what the thinking mind is, is a big thing I teach people. And so the very first drill we do in this three day boot camp, which is 22 and a half hours of instruction time, it's called passive directed body awareness training. And what it is, is we start, it's actually a two-step drill. I put my hand on one of the students' shoulders. Let's say the guy's name is Bob. I have, I tell, explain to Bob and the group, we have three primary sensory channels that our conscious mind uses to process information about our internal environment, our own thoughts and feelings, and our external environment, right? And because of the nature of how the conscious mind works, which it's the very nature of the conscious mind, it's, it's, it, when it's working well, especially, it's narrowly focused, right? Now, it can only focus on one thing at a time, but it can focus on one thing, switch to something else, focus on one thing, switch to something else, which because it can do that at a high rate of speed, it creates the illusion of multitasking. In reality, you can't multitask. Your subconscious mind can multitask. It's, it's genius at that. I'm talking conscious mind. Your conscious mind can only truly focus on one thing for a given moment of time. Now, that moment of time might only be a tenth of a second, and then it'll switch to another thing. And anybody who's ever done any kind of meditation practice knows exactly what I'm talking about. What, what, you, what you're doing in meditation practice is you're taking a portion of your mind and you're observing what the rest of your mind is doing, which I call self-awareness. Mm -hmm. In, in, the, in the positive mm -hmm. sense, because there's a, there's a negative type of self-awareness. People who are shy, who have performance anxiety, that's the negative type of self-awareness. I'm talking about where you're in first-person perspective, your mind and body are joined together, and you're simply aware of where you're, what your mind is attending to, right? So we have that ability to focus on one thing at a time. And also, you're going to focus on one thing at a time in one of five sensory channels. We're going to get rid of smell and taste because we're not eating a meal. That leaves vision, hearing, and feel. And there are parts of the brain that the neurophysiologists have actually mapped. We know that certain parts of the cortex govern speech, certain parts govern, govern um, you know, movement patterns, mo motor uh, skills, um, motor memory. Certain parts co govern vision. Certain parts go go govern auditory input or hearing. So... The trick to me is from the back to the big A word. To me, awareness is the I call it the supreme fundamental. You have to be aware of where your mind is attending to, and that means awareness. And 
in the big picture sense, most of what's involved with learning a movement pattern type of skill, like the golf swing or like, again, say karate, martial arts, most of that training is done in what I call kinesthetic or field channels. So when you're feeling a body part move, passively observing it, not trying to get it to do something different, letting it be natural, but simply observing it, that's the awareness I'm talking about. Whereas if you're in your head, picture it, well, I'll just give you an example. Let's, let's say uh, your flaw is that your right knee totally straightens in the backswing. And, and my understanding is I like to see some right knee flex, some trail knee flex at the top of the, I don't like to see a totally straight knee for a lot of different reasons. Some, had teachers that problem. Are, some teachers are okay with that. I, I don't think it's good. I think it, I think it hurts yeah. your balance. So I want to see some degree, at least 50% of the knee flex you started with in your trail leg, I want to see that maintained to the top. Let's suppose Bob's habit is he totally straightens his knee. As soon as he starts to take away, he just locks that knee, that right leg straightens. A lot of bad things happen, primarily to balance. Typically, if, I, if Bob's my new student, before I do this awareness training, and I ask him to try to keep his right knee flexed, well, here's what we'll notice. I'll watch him hit 10 balls, and there's little, typically will be zero improvement to his straightening his right knee flaw. 10, 10 swings, little or no improvement. I'll ask Bob, where was your mind? Well, Jim, I put my mind where you told me to put it. I go, where, where's that? He goes, I put it in my right knee. I go, okay, do it again. And, of course, he does another swing, right knee straightens. Then I'll have him take some swings with his eyes closed, and I'll ask him what, what's happening. And typically, if, if I'm doing this in a school format in front of several other people, other students, they're watching this, I'll, I'll say to them, um, how do you know that your right knee is staying straight? And he typically will say, well, I'm telling it to. Which, think about that for a second. He's t talking to his knee, right? I go, so what are you saying? You're hearing your own voice in your head say, right knee, keep right knee flex, keep right, or just the phrase right knee flex. He goes, yeah, I'm saying right knee flex. I go, okay. Close your eyes, do a couple. Because sometimes if a guy will cheat, he'll look to see. If he can rotate yeah. his head to see if his knee, and that, that little bit of visual input can help a little bit to keep it a little bit less straight. But I wanted to take that away. So now we can clearly see that that knee is completely straight halfway into his backswing. And I'll ask him, all right, is your right knee staying flexed or is it straightening? And almost every single time the person will say, oh, it's, it's staying flexed. How do you know? I'm telling it to. So the presumption is if you tell a body part to do something, that is the same thing as doing it, right? And sometimes I have to videotape. Usually I don't because everybody can see it. Well, you know, usually at that point, the, the rest of the group starts to laugh because they're like, well, someone will say, Bob, come on. You've done like 12 swings now. We can see your knee straighten every <laughs> single time. It doesn't matter. Talking to body parts, again, especially if you're moving at high rates of speed, doesn't work and picturing picturing the right knee flex doesn't work and I'll tell you why when you're picturing your right knee you're not paying attention to the physical reality of your right knee you're paying attention to a, a visual image in your head in your head of your yeah. right knee and your mind and body are completely cut off from each other in effect right and when you're saying the phrase right knee or right knee flex you're paying attention to the voice in your head you're not paying attention to your knee you see my point? Mm -hmm. So I always oh, call yeah. the, I call that issue being stuck in the golfing version of the Matrix. You know, the movie The Matrix, where people are living in this virtual reality world, mm -hmm. but they think it's real, but in reality they're they're in this pod and they're human batteries, right? You know, powering this gigantic machine civilization. It's kind of like that because what I try to do is get people to be aware of this and get people to stop thinking about their golf swing or about a body part, i.e., stop picturing it. Stop fantasizing about it. Stop talking to a body part, but become aware of what the body part is doing. And that's this exercise. So what they do is they swing with their eyes closed, normal speed, full backswing, full finish. I give them a body part to focus on in field channel. Now, back to my earlier step one, I, I go through what the three channels are by putting my hand on their shoulder. I ask them to close their eyes and picture it. Right. Close their eyes and talk about it. Jim's hand squeezing my shoulder, right? We go through, I'm giving you a shorthand version to save time. And then I have them feel it. And I have them go back and forth. And I give them a cue. I'll say feel. Then they nod their head when, when they've shut off the visual, shut off the auditory, and they're in pure feel. I'll say visual. Then they're picturing my hand on their shoulder. They nod their head. I'll say voice. And then they say the phrase, Jim's hand's touching my shoulder. 
and I have them go back and forth between the voice channel, the feel channel, and the visual channel so they're familiar with it. Then I have them swing a golf club with their eyes closed, totally in feel channel. That's the intention. And we usually start with the right side of their shoulder girdle. Sometimes we start with the left wrist. And it takes the average student about 15 minutes of doing this drill before they make even a single swing where they're in field channel with their mind focused on the body part. Wow. Because the mind wants to go into visual or it wants to go into auditory channel. It doesn't want to stay in feel. Or even if it starts out in feel, it'll, it'll go off of the right side of their shoulder and go to maybe their left foot or... You know, or the or the left elbow, or you know, it'll it'll wander. It won't stay focused on the on the body part they started sure. with. So, to be a successful golf skills learner and a successful golf skills practicer, you have to know how to keep your mind in the appropriate channel. And the bulk of the training, because it's a because it's a body sport. It's a sport. It's about your body. I'm not saying there's no there's no use for visual and auditory. There is, especially in the early stages. But if you look at it from like a standpoint of an educational journey going from preschool to postgraduate to PhD level, the bulk of the time is going to be spent in feel, right? And I call that the sensory feedback system. Your brain has two primary functions in terms of how it gets your body to learn motor skills. There's a sensory feedback system that tells your brain in kinesthetic or field channel what a body part is doing, right? So that's, there's, there's actually nerves in your body called sensory nerves, and they, and they send feedback from the body part up your spinal column to your brain, and eventually it, it emerges in consciousness, right? There's, there's another system called the feed-forward system, or the motor circuit or motor program circuit, that sends information from your brain back down your spinal column through your motor nerves to, to make muscles fire, muscles contract, to move a body part. Right? That's the motor program circuit. So as a coach, I've got to figure out a way to get that motor program circuit to work. And most of that's done by the slow motion training, right? The repeti- okay. high, high, high amount of reps in slow motion. But I also, yeah. I also know that that sensory feedback system is vitally important because that tells the person, again, what their body is actually doing in objective reality in, in real time, in the moment, right? So we call them the two parallel tracks. There's there's a sensory feedback training, and there's a and there's a f- feed forward circuit or motor program training. But I always start with the you know you can't develop a successful feed forward if you don't have an existing feedback. The feedback system is actually more important, especially in the early intermediate stages of learning. Wow! Wow! Got it! Got it! Okay! Okay! okay. Take a note. Take a note. Got the whole thing. That was it's amazing. amazing. All right, Jim well, Wilson. Listen, uh, again, uh, again, bounce, 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 check out video series, hours, 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 Jim Waldron, Alice Point Golf. Thanks, Thank buddy. you, Fred. Great, great being here again. Let's do it again soon. You know what's going to happen.